Hey guys, if you're over there on YouTube, please subscribe to us. And if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts, please give us a review. We just got on Spotify, so thank you so much for supporting us on that. Anyway, let's get into the episode. Welcome to the second episode of I Heart Gaming. Today's game we are tackling is Shadow of the Colossus. Wow, what a game. I cannot believe this game is out. This game that was originally released back in 2005 when I was 15 years old got released on the PS3 and then remade on the PS4. Awkward controls aside, does the game hold up? Well, today's program will consist of four acts. Act 1, The Struggle. Act 2, Tenacity in the Face of Giants. Act 3, My Review. And Act 4, the original, the remake, and the legacy. Act 1, The Struggle. This is a game of struggle and effort. A couple of years ago, I was staying in a trailer in Magnolia, Texas. I was renting a room there. I didn't have a car, and I worked at a Denny's. The Denny's was about 11 miles from where I lived. I lost my car because I put myself in a financially irresponsible position at a time where I didn't have much foresight. Think Think about this for a moment. How long does it take you to get to work? I'll give you a few seconds. Thought about it yet? It took me about an hour and 10 minutes to get to work. But how did I get to work without a car? Well, believe it or not, I rode a bicycle. I rode a bicycle for a very long time. It was a struggle to get to work every morning. Waking up late, not being ready meant that I would be hours late to work and I didn't want to take that chance. The first two weeks were brutal. My feet hurt every day for the first few weeks. And on those days where my feet were aching, I tried to sleep about 10 hours if I could. It was a challenge for a few months and I looked around me and tried to uh, figure out how to get out of this personal hell that I don't have a car, I can't go to where I need to go, I can't do the things that I want to do or even things that would make me better myself this went on for the better half of a year until i found a new job i still had to bicycle to that interview wherever that job was it was about 22 miles away and i was so excited to get the job partially due to uh, my determination of getting to the interview without a car i stopped at a chipotle uh for on the way back home and i would highly recommend that No matter how excited you are, you don't go to Chipotle after bicycling 22 miles only to have to bicycle 22 miles back home. Terrible idea, Romero. Terrible. Uh, For a bit of time of my life, that was my endeavor. Even now, I still ride my bicycle to work whenever I can because I don't want to forget how that changed me. Our hero, Wander, is young and full of the same tenacity that I had. In this game, he climbs giants to save somebody. I can't compare that ever to my life. And even what tenacity I did have, Wander has a lot more. Your labors and day-to-day life probably can't even compete to the scenario that our protagonist is in and that we will discuss. And this is why I love video games. We're transported to a world far away. You know, you fill in their shoes, see the world through their perspective. Think of your personal endeavors and connect them to Wander. For those of you that don't know what Wander has done, sit down and listen. Now, just a quick uh, spoiler alert. We will discuss some spoilers. I recommend if you haven't played the game now, uh, just stop listening. Pull over. (laughs) Just stop. And uh, come back uh, when you do finish the game, and then uh, we can talk about this a little bit more in depth.
The game starts off with an eagle flying over the land. The eagle comes down and the camera pans to Wander. Wander is a young man. He has a horse and on his horse he is carrying a corpse. He is trying to save the life of a fallen woman. Now, we don't know what happened to this woman. Her fate is unknown. However, Wander's determination is clear. He wants to save her and that is his resolve. Eventually, he reaches a gate with an extremely high bridge leading to a castle bridge that looks like it's easily three miles long. Wander continues across the long bridge and reaches the castle. Once in the castle, he descends to the bottom where he reaches an altar with some statues across the roll. Now, if you're looking at these statues with a keen eye, you can spot that these idols all look different from one another. Some look like serpents. Some look like humanoid beings. Others, wholeheartedly, unique. In the beginning of the game, you only glance at these for a few seconds between the cutscenes, and you can hardly recognize what they actually are. If you're a person with no knowledge of these games, then these statues just seem like decorations for a strange castle in an irregular world. Wander places the woman, whose name is Mono, on the Shrine of Worship. It is here where he is given his task by the god Dorman. Dorman is a god whose real form is a bit unknown. He or she seems to have the power to revive people as long as they participate in his or her ritual. The laws of this unique and forbidden land are also unknown and so is this god's power. The game has its own original language so it's difficult to even really understand the stated tones from the characters in this game if you're not directly looking at their faces. I'll play you a clip of the introduction to this world. Was you hick? Aurel yek for all. Dorman does not have a form, but he is somewhat omnipotent. Not only does he not have a form, but he or she speaks as if they are more than one person. It seems like they overlaid a man's voice with a woman's voice. And... That is the reason why we keep referring to Dorman as he or she. It, it seems to have a very masculine and feminine voice playing at the same time. And here's here's a little sample. I so let's look at the players on the board. We have Mono who is dead, who also had an unknown but unfortunate fate. Wonder, who wants to revive her, which seems to be his main motivation. And Dorman, a god Wonder has turned to in order to use his power to revive her. Lastly, the setting is what's constantly referred to as the Forbidden Land. It is a peninsula somewhere that has been blocked off to what I'm assuming is the general public, but it seems like getting to this peninsula is a is not the easiest task. It is revealed later in the game that there is actually a small caravan of soldiers chasing Wander. However, it is also implied that he is days, possibly even weeks or months ahead of them because it's hard to understand the passage of time in this game. As explained by Dorman, Wander needs to take down the 16 Colossi that represent each one of the idols at the altar. Earlier, we talked about the struggles that people face and how I overcame my personal struggle. This is Wander's struggle. To revive Mono, he must enlist the help of Dorman. And for Dorman to help him, he must destroy the Colossi. All of the Colossus. He must climb them and kill them. And that will be his feet.
Act 2, Tenacity in the Face of Giants. This game has 16 individual colossi. Uh, and I've thrown the word colossi around without really elaborating it. Marion Webster defines colossus as a statue of gigantic size and proportions, or a person of the or thing of immersed size or power. And then the plural form of colossus is colossi. And then here's some fun facts from Miriam themselves. The original colossi were the larger than life statues made by Greeks and Roman. The most famous of these were the Colossus of Rhodes, a statue of the sun god Helios built on the Greek island of Rhodes around 280 BC that was over 100 feet tall and took more than 12 years to build. 12 years. The Statue of Liberty is a modern Colossus, the enormous and stately at the entrance of the New York Harbor. And someone who has played a colossal role in history, such as Winston Churchill, may be called a Colossus as well. That would be an accurate observation. Now this next bit is a bit visual, so if you're on the YouTubes, you'll have no problem with it, but in comparison, uh, but in comparison to the Shadow of Liberty, <laughs> Statue of Liberty, uh, the last Colossus you fight, uh, Malus, the 16th Colossi, is substantially bigger than the Shadow of, of Liberty. There's a cool blog out there called Nomad's Blog, and he has done a substantial amount of research on this game's asset, uh, assets and the appropriate measurements of the actual colossus. size. He goes into great detail about the, the size and measurements of these beasts. I highly recommend checking him out if you just want to know more about all the in-game assets as it's, it seems that he poured countless hours creating the measurements for comparisons. Most of the Colossus themselves are about the size of the Statue of Liberty, which is crazy if you think about it. Not with the hand up, by the way. Not with the hand up, just like head size. Um, these things that Wander has to climb uh, are as big as Lady Freedom herself. And uh, think for a second and envision what it would be like to climb the Shadow of Liberty. From the bottom of the robe where the foot starts to the crown. Now, I know it's a video game. I know it's silly to keep putting things on a pedestal as we keep going but i am in awe that you have this this human who doesn't doesn't have superpowers he isn't and has it's just him his wits his tenacity and his his special sword but mostly him we spent some time already talking about the colossus and how integral they are to the plot as well as some of the challenges that they bring to our protagonist what exactly are they what are the colossi and how are they represented well, the first Colossus is named Phallus. And also, side note, these names that we we'll use throughout the podcast are names given to the Colossus, to the Colossi by fans. The Colossi are normally just numbered, but fans have universally accepted the names given to the Colossus. Now, back to Phallus. It is a humanoid, bipedal, ogre-looking monster that ha- looks like it has a head of a minotaur he has fur around most of his body. Uh, his seagull, his, his, his special, like, um, I don't want to say spot, but a, a special sign that shows up around the, the sword that Wander uses is his weak spot. It's on his head, and I believe on hard mode, it's also on his right uh, elbow. The seagull is an important part of all of this because the seagull is what allows regular humans to kill these monsters. The seagull is a glowing insignia that appears when Wander's sword is unsheathed and near them. They can also be spotted using the sword's power. Now, there are somewhat unofficial classes of colossi. There are bipedal humanoids, which is what Valis is. Then there are quadrupedal colossi. There is a bird colossi. And there are some serpent colossi that are unique in their own ways. The three smallest colossi are also unique in the sense that they're only a a little bit bigger than Wander. The last Colossi is bipedal, but isn't all that mobile. Then there are a few Colossi that actually use projectiles, which almost always completely catch me off guard. Even though there are only 16, you really do get a feel for the variety and uniqueness out of each one. Even though each one is vague in how you approach them, it isn't difficult to find the proper route to the weakness. 
it has an old school approach in the sense that you don't immediately see the weak points but there are auxiliary ways to get to those weak points and that's just general information on the of the colossus so let's get let's go into the individuals the 16 individual colossi that must be killed in order of appearance so the first one is valas he's fought in a small valley is described as a minotaur he's covered mostly in fur and fur his horns are cut off and he holds a club in his hand and the he was in the original cover for the ps2 game the original shadow of the colossus colossi number two is Qua, or, or the second colossus is quadratus he has fought on the shore of a small lake he is quadrupedal. quadrupedal. Uh, he is bull-like in shape, like an actual bull. And even though he is on all fours, he seems to be about as tall as the first Colossus, Phallus. Now, Gaius. This is this is the, the famous one. This is the one on the cover for the PS4. He is he is on a he is fought on a race platform that feels like a small round arena raised above a lake. In the PS, uh, in the PS4 game, he is the cover monster, and he's also described as a knight, and only has a bit of fur with mostly armor around his body where the fur would normally be. It has a sword-like weapon, but it doesn't really have like I don't want to say sharp edge, but just not a traditional sword, more more like um, a beating stick. The next one is Phaedra. It is fought in a graveyard of sorts. It is horse-like, and it's also quadrupedal like the second uh, Colossus. It has fur, but only on the outer top, only on the outer body at the top of its body. The next one, the fifth Colossi, Avion. It is fought in a lake, but it feels more like a building that was inundated with water to the point where the platforms at the top of the water seem to actually be the top of the castle or building. It looks like a predator bird, a bird of prey, if you will. It has a huge wingspan with a long tail that's longer than each of its wings. It's a huge bird. Most of its body is covered in fur. The sixth one, Barba, it is fought in a huge underground temple. It's ogre shaped, similar to the first Colossi. However, it does have a huge beard that makes it very easy to grab onto. And it does have some armor and and he does does have a lot of skin not only that but um his his arms extend all the way down to his knees he's got some huge large arms hydra is the one that has, has to be tamed after that well killed actually it is fought in a big lake it has a uh, plenty of fur to grab onto and it has the body of a neo but the face of a catfish it can use its body to conduct electricity. Holding on to this monster is tricky because it will take you pretty deep water if you keep on holding on to it. And that can be dangerous because once you run out of breath or your stamina and you have to go to the surface, it's a it's a good two minutes to get to the surface, which is scary. Kurumari is the following colossi. He has fought in an underground coliseum, a, a, sm a small but vertically big coliseum. He doesn't have, uh, he's not a big colossi, so he actually doesn't have a whole bunch that Wanderer can actually grab onto. And what there is to grab is hard to get. He attacks using projectiles. Uh, it also isn't big in comparison to the other colossi, as I said earlier. Super small. It's quadrupedal and it's shaped like a lizard. Climbs walls and really forces you to think outside the box like most of these do. Bazaran is the, is the next one. He's fought in like a foggy desert terrain that has geysers spurting water throughout the fight. He's one of my favorites because I love how the camera pans around uh, as you approach him on the horse. He also fires projectiles. It looks like it's the shape of a tortoise. The, this Colossus is probably one of, the, one of the widest colossi in the whole game. He doesn't have much to actually grab onto to climb him. And you'll notice that right there start becoming a trend at this point. Uh, Dirge is uh, one that's fought in an underground lair in a cave uh, that has sand all over the floor. Uh, for its size, it actually isn't big. Like, 
And like most of the Colossi, it does have plenty of fur to grab onto for its body size. It's a serpentine though, and it flows in and out of the sand, making it very difficult to actually get to. Celosia is the next Colossi. It has a temple in a pit that you must descend to. You must ride its back to attack it. It's a, it's a lion, and it is one of the two smallest Colossi in the entire game. Pelagia, uh, this thing is fun to like. This Colossi I would describe as a pain in the ass, actually. Not my favorite Colossi. Actually, the Colossi I like the least. It's hard to describe it because most of the other Colossus, they're shaped like an animal or two. This one is a little bit like a platypus in the sense that it feels like it's a conglomerate of animals. It seems to have the body similar to a gorilla, but it also has tusks. And it has teeth on its head. <laughs> what the hell? Phalanx is fought in the desert. It is the longest of the Colossi. A huge serpentine just stretching across miles of desert. Um, it also has some weird insect-like features, like fluid sacs. And uh, the horse is required to take this one down. And because you have to shoot at it from the ground, which is insane. And once you shoot at it, force it to come down and jump on its back. He flies all over the sky, and it's my favorite Colossi just because of the scene and how you actually get onto the Colossus. It's a lot of fun to go up against the Phalanx. Zenobia is fought in some ruins. It is uh, the dog. It's about the same size as the lion. However, it's heavily plated in armor and is a quadrupedal. Argus. Argus is fought in a fortress-like arena. has a little bit the face of like um, a monkey. Uh, it's tall and he wields a huge cleaver and has extremely long arms. This one uh, gets back to the basics of what Shadow of the Colossus is compared to the first boss, Valis. And he's got a, actually a lot of fur. It's just not easily accessible. It's a humanoid and bipedal. Now, Malus. The final Colossi. He has his own temple and arena. It is the most human looking Colossi. It has a battle dress, but it isn't very mobile. Its feet are bolted down. It can fire projectiles. It's incredibly big and tall, about twice the size of most of the Colossi you've faced so far. Which means that Malice himself is only is, is bigger than let's say the Statue of Liberty. Now, those are the 16 Colossi, and describing them doesn't do them justice. I heavily recommend playing the game yourself. Every arena is unique, and while traveling the land, you get a fair look at how massive these things really are. Throughout the land, you see oceans, deserts, mountains, forests, lakes, temples, ruins, coliseums. You get a feeling that people used to live here. Upon killing each Colossi, you're greeted by shadowy tentacles that seem to pierce, wander, and transport him back to the Shrine of Worship. Upon arriving and waking up, Dorman greets you with, to, with the next Colossi you must slay. And while sleeping, Wanderer is surrounded by shadowy figures who look like they take the shape of men. A new one stands beside you, uh, looking at you for every Colossi you destroy. So by the end of the game, you have about 15 or 16. As you keep killing giants though, Wanderer's physical appearance begins to decay slowly. My personal fan theory is that each one of the shadowy figures that represents how many colossi you've killed tells you how many times the ritual has been completed in the past. By the time Wander enters the Forbidden Peninsula, there are 16, so 16 rituals have been performed. It's unconfirmed, but it, it's my personal fan theory. What do I think about this game? To put it frankly, this game is great. 
It isn't very long. I clocked in at right under 5 hours. If you delve more into time attack and other features, you can easily spend more than 10 hours in this game. Shadow of the Colossus, it's not a long lasting game, it's very enduring. This video game, this form of media deeply cements itself into your emotions. I haven't played this game in a while, and it was amazing that I still remembered for the most part all the ins and outs of what I had to do. This is a very special game. People often have the argument of whether games are art, and the short answer to that question will almost always be yes, because you can make an argument that so many things in the world can be seen as art. But this game really is art. It casted a wide shadow that other games and even the original studio that created it have had a difficult time following in their footsteps. The simplicity of this game cannot be overstated enough. You ride your horse from the castle to the arena. You fight and slay the beast. Upon slaying the beast, you're teleported to the castle once more, rinse and repeat. There are a few cutscenes sprinkled throughout the playthrough, but that's it. It reminds me of a simpler time when games didn't need an insane amount of exposition. And every once in a while, you get that feeling again right here. That special feeling of discovering, wondering, figuring out the story with no real help from the game. It's a splendid feeling to relive. Something that I felt in Orcarina Time, or even that my friends describe in Dark Souls. It is a feeling where you have, you yourself, have to fill in the blanks that the story doesn't give you. Shadow of the Colossus doesn't tell you who Wonder is, what Mono did, who or why he is in a forbidden land, why the land is forbidden, and why Dorman can revive people. All those questions go unanswered. If you want answers, you gotta fill them in yourself. A great example would be the nicknames that the Colossi have. They were given by fans, universally accepted by fans. I don't know how intentional this storytelling device is, or if it was done due to the original limitations of the PS2, but it is successful. Being remastered for the PS4 just makes Shadow so much better. The game relies on its environment and tone to convey storytelling. The improved graphics just make it better at it. The best word to describe it would be epic. There are still shortcomings though, such as the controller and replay replayability. Time attack mode is awesome, and there are inclusion of a few more bonus items this time around. There are also some filters you can play around with, uh, and photo mode can get addicting searching for the perfect photo in this world because of all the wonderful environments. And those photos can be used for a wallpaper on the PS4, or my laptop, or even my cell phone. The bow shooting feels a bit more accurate this time around, and you get a better sense of speed whilst riding aggro. On the PS4 version, there are still a lot of glitches, uh, and some of the glitches from the original have been removed altogether. So you have some new glitches, and some old glitches have been taken apart. And while seeing them every now and then can generate a few laughs, one thing I haven't touched upon would be the sound. The sound design in this game is superb. It's ambient, it's hollow, it's loud, it is powerful all at once. The Colossi falling down always makes my eyes widen because of the addition of this music. The overworld is ambient. It's quiet. It stays quiet as you approach. Themes play as you fight and take down the beasts. The soundtrack is widely regarded as one of the best video game soundtracks ever. I cannot overstate how much I highly recommend this game.
Act 4, the original, the remake, and the legacy. The original Shadow of the Colossus was released in October of 2005. I just turned 15 years old. I was in the high time of my video game career, having just finished Metal Gear Solid 3, about to get into Metal Gear Solid 3 subsistence. I was really getting into games, big time dude. I was trying out different hairstyles, chasing a cat in California, getting ready for a big move from California to Texas, drawing and a whole bunch of other things. Oh young Romero, how I cringe at you and your emo hair and outlook on the world. And by the way, young Romero, things did get better. Development for the game began in 2002 under the title of Nico. It was a sequel to Ico. Ico was Team Ico's first game. There aren't many details on the game until about 2004. Uh, the studio was very silent about what it was actually working on. There's plenty of interviews afterwards, though, them explaining what the game was once it was out in the wild. One of the early titles for the game would have been uh, Wonder to Chiazzo. I think I said that right. Or the English translation would have been Wonder and the Colossus. Early concepts of the game even had potential multiplayer mode, or the game itself was going to use various characters to take down the Colossi. There were even many unused colossi, as one of the concepts for this game originally had 25 colossi. <laughs> I don't think the unused colossi will be released as DLC. However, it is fun knowing that they toyed around with a, a lot of ideas before they settled on 16. Each of the 16 colossi feel wholly unique, while at the same time teaching you a new way about how to play the game. Describing the game to people <laughs> was a bit weird. And at the time, it was unheard of to have a game that was mostly just a boss, a boss rush. The studio mostly kept quiet, and what was released was taken by surprise. GameSpy has a great article from 2006 written by uh, Save Kosak detailing the technical limits that they had. Now, this is a small excerpt from that article where they are describing how Kenji Kyoto, a producer of the game, describes some of the technical issues. And just a heads up, GameSpy... Uh, the website no longer really makes news, so um, just keep that up. Just keep that in mind. So, the, in describing te technical challenges, one of the first was organic collision deformation. That's a fancy way of describing how the game detects if the player is touching the Colossus, no matter how big the lumbering giant moves. If the main character is hanging onto the leg, he'll have to move along with it as the leg moves up. If the leg moves up so that it's horizontal, your character should be able to run across the flat surfaces as though they're level ground. This challenge gets particularly tricky if joints are closing. What if your character is behind a creature's knee as it bends its enormous leg? The player has to get squeezed. The second technical challenge is called Player Dynamics and Reactions. It's easy, Kaido tells us, to have a character hang off Colossus or stay still as the Colossus moves. But what if the character is swinging? Getting the physics right as the Colossus moves was apparently very tricky, although you wouldn't know it from how smoothly it works in the final game. A third technical challenge what was, was what, what Kaido called motion blending and posture control. These technologies could be seen on a small scale with the horse. If you were galloping at a full run and turned the horse, the horse would smoothly tilt its head and lean into a turn. The two animations blended in a way that made it look very organic. It's hard to notice it in the final product, but smooth animation blending made the horse look like it was real and alive instead of jerky, choppy video game character. And also, keep in mind that at the time that this was a PS2 game, and this issue would be a difficult one to overcome with the hardware limitations. We take it for granted that developers communicate more now or that studios are backed with even more money than they were before or that the internet has become a great place where people talk about game development constantly. The environment has changed. The producer for the game, Fumito Ueda, was an artist and pitched the game as, uh, through a video as he did previously with Ico. It was very unheard of for anybody to do that. And even if Ueda doesn't make games now or if he is silently making a game, his role was very piv was a pivotal influence. Even he himself took influence from games like Legend of Zelda and other games took influence from Shadow. 
He didn't have a role in the remake, but his original vision is there. The assets remained. The story stayed the same. Emphasis on the art feels as prevalent. This is an early reaction to the Shadow of the Colossus from GameSpot back in 2005, just detailing how people were excited to see the game as it was making its debut. Fans of 2001's PlayStation 2 cult classic, Eco, will quickly notice the inspired artwork and vast, desolate, beautiful environments of this game as being unmistakably similar. Indeed, that's because Shadow of the Colossus is being brought to you by the same team who developed that game. Only this time, the focus is squarely on these epic battles against more than a dozen different behemoths. The game attempts to combine exploration, platforming, combat, and puzzle-solving elements to create an experience that, well, just look at it. It's pretty much unlike anything else out there. Recently, we had a chance to play through a demo that allowed us to square off against the game's first three colossi, which gave us a good impression of what to expect, but also raised some interesting questions. The story of Shadow of the Colossus is shrouded in mystery. Upon release, the original was praised all the way around, citing things like environment, music, story, the Colossus themselves. Uh, Metacritic gave the original one a 91 out of 100. IGN gave it a 9.7 out of 10. Game Informer gave it an 8.75 out of 10. GameSpot, 8.7 out of 10. It was crazy. I don't know what more I can say about this that hasn't already been echoed in a decade of praise. The PS4 Master set the world on fire and received similar scores. Metacritic right now has a 91 over 100. Uh, Game Informer, 9 out of 10. Uh, GameSpot, 9 out of 10. IGN, 9.7 out of 10. Polygon, 9.5 out of 10. If anything, the remaster got better praise. It's always hard to point out an inflection point where games change, and normally it's always attributed to a console release. I would say that Shadow of the Colossus made it easier than before to call games as a form of art. As far as its lasting legacy, it helps solidify that games can be art. It also gave one of the best video game cameos ever. There's a small Adam Sandler movie called Rain Over Me starring uh, War Machine, Don Shield himself, and the Wasp, Liv Tyler. <laughs> um, it's a great movie, but there's a great scene where Adam Sandler is alone in his apartment and his friend uh, Don Child walks in on him playing Shadow of the Colossus. And they play the game the whole night. <laughs> Let's go over the scene in question right now. Come so in. Don Child uh, walks in. Colossus. Adam Sandler says Colossus. Hey. And in the the background. Hey, hey, Mike. Take you can your shoes hear it. off. Just listen. I told you. The theme music. I told you. That's right. So, takes his shoes off, comes over. He sees Adam Sandler's room is a mess. He's hey, just looking just around. <laughs> and, and for you guys that don't know, uh, Adam Sandler is a 9/11 survivor, which is why he's so distressed. He sits down next to Adam Sandler. He's watching them play. He's like, "Let me try. Come on. Let me try. Just watch me do it. Let me, let me, let me just try." And okay, this you, scene is shoot? great. The square is the stab, and that's the bird. You want to shoot him, get his attention. This is right. great because right, it brings back those and memories of when you're a child, <laughs> <laughs> and um, you can really connect with the characters right here. I could show you how to do it, give you some hints, but I'll warn you, it's very addictive. Well, I don't have an addictive personality, so just show me how to do it. So, hands on the controller. Else, is that funny? All right. That'll call your horse, the triangle second jump. Okay, and then right what first. we get is a I great montage. Come stab him in the arm. No, you, you gotta stab him in the right spot. Come stab him right yeah. there. You gotta be on the light. Shit. Stab him. That's not gonna you work. See? I gotta climb this big son of a bitch. <laughs> So just, just put and uh, down, in this right? montage, next you just, you, over, you know, you stay up all night just yeah. playing this game. There's, right now. No next. Now. I thought you don't have an addictive personality. <laughs> that was the line of the night, man. <laughs> you're an addict. Say it, man. Say you're an yeah. addict. Okay, I'm an addict. <laughs> and it's just a great montage of just, like, these colossus going down. These two guys playing Come on, it. Now, stab it oh, oh, my God. God. Oh, I'm on your and ass, Bart. That's oh, oh, they just shout Colossus so dorky. <laughs> it's a it's a great scene.
that's it. That's today's program. If you haven't gotten this game, get it. I recommend the PS4 version as well. This is a solid game. A lot of work went into uh, this podcast, and there's still so much about this game that I didn't even talk because I was running out of time and training for a race. Next episode will be on Soul Calibur V. I will try and get it out by next month. I already started recording and writing, and I'm pretty excited about it since, especially since Soul Calibur VI keeps announcing new characters. And at the time of writing, they just announced uh, Siegfried. Granted, a Soul Calibur game without Siegfried, it's like Mortal Kombat without Scorpion, but still very excited. And my hype levels are up there. Are up there. Now, I will be taking a look back at Soul Calibur V, arguably the most divisive Soul Calibur. As always, thank you so much for your time. And you guys have a good day. We'll catch you later.